Okay, we're going to start with session three on standards. And um, we heard a lot so far on performance and engineering standards, starting with Dr. Garber this morning, talking about the importance in the last edition of the guide. And uh, we heard a lot of the high level overview from both Dr. Sykes and Dr. Harper about how much this topic came up in the standing committee. And uh, I don't have a, next slide, I don't have a whole lot of additional material to put to this, except that I would say that my takeaway from the, the listening sessions was that there was overwhelming stakeholder support for performance-based standards, as we've heard from a number of different speakers. And this came out of a desire for the guide to be flexible. But at the same time, we heard from many of the scientific groups that provided input into the listening sessions that it was very important to have uh, explicit language in the guide for a desire for institutional oversight of this. The flexibility should be, um, it should be made known that one size doesn't fit all and that there had to be significant flexibility for institutional oversight. And whatever was done, the outcomes had to be based in evidence and based in science. And that was the underpinning for whatever standards are to be put forward in the guide. And whether those are performance or in certain limited cases, engineering type of approaches, it still should be evidence-based and should be based in science. And that there were current parts of the guide for which it was really uncertain where the evidence was or where the standards came from. Next slide. Now, as Dr. Sykes brought up this morning, there were comments where, while there was a strong desire for performance-based approaches to be maintained, there were some individuals that really thought there were parts of the guide for which engineering standards were better because they're easier to implement or because uh, they allowed support for resource management or they gave the guide more teeth. Um, and this, this was not universally shared um, and was a minority view, but I think there was desire on the part of the entire stakeholder community for more examples of outcomes and how outcomes were derived uh, in the guide. Next. And this strong desire for outcomes and performance approaches also brought up a lot of discussion about could ways be devised for which institutions could actually share information um, and the need for knowledge sharing and the challenges that each institution would have in redoing similar types of performance-based studies and validating approaches for their individual institution, if in fact they could really use knowledge garnered in other studies and, and have it accepted without extensive redoing and extensive revalidation. And so this was something that came up over and over again in uh, multiple stakeholder discussions, and particularly in some of the uh, more scientifically based groups with um, researchers present. So I think this is something that we as a laboratory animal science community are going to have to think about, because many things that we do in our in our community do not get well published. They're not published in high visibility uh, journals necessarily. Um, but they can often be very impactful information. And so how we, you know, validate information, how we share information, how we develop repositories for performance-based approaches, I think it's going to be very important. But there was a strong sentiment by many groups um, to have the guide contain good examples of how institutions could be guided in achieving performance-based approaches. Next. So one thing that um, 
we thought about as a um, planning committee is that in addition to the stakeholder groups that we were um, discussing things with, we we came across the fact that we also have sister groups. Um, there, there are groups that are not actually users of the guide. The stakeholder groups of the guide are very broad, but there are groups that do very similar things to what the consensus committee that's going to write the guide does. Um, so we noted as a standing committee that we should get input from groups like uh, groups that are doing the biological safety manual, groups that do guidance documents and have experience with guidance documents, and there are learnings to be garnered from those groups. So one of the things we tried to do in this planning committee for this workshop is to incorporate some speakers from those kinds of groups. And um, I'm happy to say in this particular session, one of the speakers, Paul Meachin, uh, hopefully will talk to us a little bit about his experience you know, in that regard. But we're going to start now um, into the speakers. I'll, I'll let Paul start and we'll be followed by uh, Mark, Kate, and Steve. And they will give some selected examples and some selected experiences with the use of performance versus engineering standards. But um, this was a very large topic, and there would be plenty more speakers and plenty more examples that could be discussed in a session like this. So uh, take it away, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Everett. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you to the members of the committee for inviting me. Uh, I am um, the, I was the CDC's editor for the sixth edition of biosafety and microbiological and biomedical laboratories, along with Jeff Potts, who was my counterpart at NIH. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the decisions that we made during the, the deliberations that led to the publication of BMBL6 in November 2020. Uh, I do have to acknowledge that I am no longer with the federal government or with, obviously not with CDC. And so any comments that I make do not necessarily reflect the views of the CDC or NIH or Health and Human Services or the US government at all. They are my personal observations based on what we did during the development of, of the, the sixth edition of the BNBL. Next slide, please. So for those of you that are not particularly familiar with the BNBL, you're probably in the same boat I am regard, is, is with regard to the, the guide. I know it, I've used it, I've worked with my attending veterinarians over it, but how it gets made is a bit of a black box. So I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes on that. Like the guide, uh, it has undergone periodic uh, updates since its first publication in 1984. And as I said, we're on the sixth edition. Somewhat differently from the guide, it is the unique property of the heads of the environmental health and safety organizations at both NIH and CDC and that those individuals are the editors and the timing of which a update is developed is solely dependent on their ability to, to do so. Uh, it comes out of their budget. It is other duties as described. And so there is not a formal organization behind the development or publication of the, the BMBL. Also slightly differently for the guide is because we are federal employees, and this is a federal publication, it comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. We were under the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee, uh, Committee Act, FACA, which meant that we could not have outside members routinely participating in group discussions. We did held, we, we held a, uh, a stakeholders meeting, so a listening session, much like this, uh, like you've been discussing, uh, through the Academy, and received feedback and then receive feedback in person, but we were unable to have focus groups or other significant input during the development and publication, subsequent publication of the BNBL. So this was done primarily internally through the federal government. Also, unlike the guide, we do not attach ourselves or are, we are not attached to any federal regulations or requirements. And so as a federal organization publishing this guidance document, we deliberately stayed outside the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act 
uh, Dr. De, uh, De Vicente, uh earlier when he's talking about uh, the, through the, what uh, the USDA, what APHIS uh, was showing for development of a, of a regulation. We deliberately did not follow those steps. So this could not be used as a regulatory guidance. It is supposed to be guidance only. We make that absolutely clear in the forward. Whether or not a group or agency chooses to use it as a, as a regulatory document, that is their decision. And it could be argued that unless you accept it as a term of, of uh, grant or contract, um, the legal applicability of the BMBL to a regulatory schema is in question. Next slide, please. So we ran into a significant problem. And that is that in the earlier editions, first five editions, much like you have in the guide, we had should, shall, and must sprinkle throughout our requirements for containment and for both the animal and the laboratory side. And so I've put in one example from the, uh, the BMBL regarding that exact language. And you can see that the first line says should, and then the subsequent sub bullets say must, which led us to an internal inconsistency. And much like uh, the discussion that uh, Dr. Hickman was talking about with ALAC, and whether a should is an optional enhancement and a must or shall is a, is a base requirement, we had that feedback from our, our members as well, is that they were confused as to what that should be. When does a guide say shall? And when does a guide, what does a guide mean by should? It's guidance. We had no regulatory authority to determine either. And so the use of those terms became a problem for us. So next slide, please. So we made a decision. It took us a while to get to it because we were struggling with how, how we could emphasize particular items within the guidance. And the answer in the end became very clear, don't. It is, we, we made these simple declarative sentences. So instead of saying, for example, uh, glove, gloves must be worn, we simply say gloves are worn. The other part is it's different with BNBL, and this is a big difference between you and the guide, or between the guide and BNBL, is that we have an entire section before we talk about the containment levels and what they should have, we have an entire section on risk assessment. And our focus prior to showing you what the containment is, is that one need, uh, the organization needs to have a risk assessment process to determine what elements of containment are needed and which ones are not. And when you go into our, our sections four and five, we talk about containment within a laboratory and then containment within a vivaria for small animals, that you can actually have additions to that and you can have subtractions provided you have documentation. So the organization and the BMBL again is a little different than, than you because we do not have, we do not formally call out for an IBC or an institutional biosafety committee like you have for IACUC. We recommend that there, we suggest that there be an organization akin to an institutional biosafety committee, but we don't necessarily call it that way since that is an NIH requirement for the recombinant guidelines, that there be an organization that includes the, the, the various stakeholders, the PI, the safety office, the occupational health, facilities, animal personnel that make the decisions that assemble what is the key group that makes the decision on the risk assessment and the risk tolerance for the organization. It has to be the entire organization. It's not an institution, not a PI uh, recommendation or um, choosing. So that allows us the freedom to do this where we simply made declarative sentences. And so things like what we showed you in the previous slide where we had shoulds and shalls simply became declarative sentences. The, you decontam decontaminate work surfaces after it. Spills are cleaned up, they are contained. So the shoulds and shalls and musts disappeared with one exception. If this was driven by a an outside regulatory authority, OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard, chemical hygiene plant, wh whatever outside influence had a regulatory basis for, making a for us making a statement, we said must. And so outside that, 
we've, we've ended the option of having should, shall, and must. They're simply, this is what is, is the best practice within the, uh, the organization. And then the risk assessment is done by the institution, by the, preferably an institutional committee. Next slide, please. So we use slightly different language than the guide does. Where you talk about performance versus engineering, we talked about prescriptive versus performance. Because to us, you could have prescription, you could have performance in engineering, in administrative controls, in personal, personal protective equipment, or it could be prescriptive in any of those. And so we use slightly different language to be able to differentiate whether or not we were telling you what you need to do or what the goal is you needed to, to uh, achieve. And where we could, we erred on the side of, of performance-based guidance. It was clear to our from our, our feedback from our membership that they preferred the flexibility to achieve their safety targets rather than us being prescriptive, which may or may not have actually achieved the goals they wanted. If we were being simply prescriptive, we could have develop, developed requirements for say the facility for a BSL-3 facility that was completely unacceptably stringent for something like SARS-CoV-2, where perhaps you don't necessarily need to be able to gas decon a facility or need HEPA exhaust. So where we could make performance-based things like uh, inward directional airflow, we don't tell you how to do it, whether or not it's 0.05 inch water gauge or whether it's 200 cubic feet per minute in inward airflow, that's not our decision. We allow them wherever possible to make those decisions. And then even where the, and the one other part that we were very insistent on, where we had to be prescriptive, we tried to give them as many options as possible to try to limit what we meant by prescriptive. For example, gloves are worn. We don't tell you what type of glove, nitrile, latex, long sleeve, short. We don't give that information. We allow you to have the flexibility to do that. And it does play it and does put an additional burden on the Institutional Biosafety Committee and the principal investigator to make those decisions. But we think that they are the people who are most likely to come up with the right decisions. And so we, we erred on the side of giving them the performance standards rather than prescriptive standards. As, as I said in the slide, technology changes. And so we can't anticipate those outcomes. We cannot anticipate the next emerging pathogen and what it will need for containment. And so in the absence of that sort of ability to define what's coming next, we thought the performance standards were going to be far better than prescriptive. And there are problems with doing, being prescriptive, including being prescriptive in administrative controls, such as the example we've got in there, that animals and plants not associated with the work being performed, they're not permitted in the laboratory. Fairly prescriptive, fairly straightforward, we thought. And it makes sense, and you, most people who are working with the guide don't want animals, the bring your animal to work day is not something to be favored in a vivarium. But what happens if you do have a service animal? And somebody says, you have a prescriptive requirement that says I cannot have that animal because it's not actually associated with the work. We didn't think that that would be a problem since we're a guidance document and the Americans with Disability Act is a law. However, there are people who have actively discouraged and obstructed individuals who have service animals from entering containment laboratories, even when they have the appropriate methods in place to reduce the risk of the service animal. And so even if you're being prescriptive and you think that it's, it's easy, fairly straightforward, having prescriptive standards has a tendency to have unanticipated consequences that are unfortunate. And so if you can avoid them, I really recommend that you try to avoid them. Next slide, please. We do, I do agree. There has been a number of, of comments that have been made that in, in testing the performance, it can be it can be difficult. And sharing that information, as has been stated by others, is exactly what they'll need to do. And we allow people, well, people are encouraged to use published methodologies to be able to verify their performance. We don't specify how you determine, for example, at BSL-3, that you don't have a reversal of airflow under failure conditions. You can smoke test, you can do a pressure gauge 
uh, reading as the as the fans fail. Even though it's perform, even though it's it's prescriptive in that you are not allowed to have the reverse of airflow, the method by which you verify it is up to you. And as long as you document it, it's it's acceptable. So even where there is some prescription, where you can afford, where you can give people that by that variability, and I would make it clear in the opening, in the introduction to your uh, your document to the guide that where there is silence, even where something is prescriptive, that the method by which they obtain the results that you're looking for are up to the, the up to the eye cook. And yes, it does place an additional burden on them. However, so does a so does an absolute requirement that gives them no flexibility. Next slide, please. Paul, you have about one minute left. Wonderful, because that's what I'm going to, that's all I've got to do. So I've actually talked about this. And yes, there are going to be some areas that you're going to have to be, and, and we did too, where it's it defines the containment, such as a bias safety level three, a, a class three cabinet and a, and a uh, cabinet lab. There are not options and you will have to live with that. Next slide, last slide. Couple of quick things. We've heard in the discussions that there was a thought about being electronic. Our stakeholders were very vocal. They wanted hard copies because they they take notes in them, they tab them, they use it. The other question was having intermediate copies, having version 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. There was absolute no support for that because the problem is if you don't know who's got your manual, your guide, you cannot push a change to it. And therefore you will have a difference, a discrepancy between what you have published and what they're abiding by. And that's unfair to the recipients of, of those documents. So we decided against it. We're having an, an addenda, an errata essentially, but we are not going to formally publish a version 6.1 or 6.2 until and between the sixth and seventh edition. So hopefully that gives you some things to see that we did a little differently than you have and some thoughts for the future. And I wish you all the best in, in making the ninth edition. Thank you. Thank you so much. And my apologies. I um, personally, uh, this was this section of the workshop has been highly anticipated. And so um, I might let the speakers go a minute or two over um, to finish their slide. Um, next up, we have Mark Churchland, I believe. Please take it away. Hi, thanks. Do I have control over the uh, the slides? No, someone Eric? else will be advancing the slides for you. Oh, Eric indicated he was giving oh, he me does. control. Oh, he did. Okay, great. Okay, lovely. Well, we'll hope that works. So um, I'm I'm excited to be invited to do this. Is This is going to be a little bit different, I think, from most of the other talks, for better or for worse, but hopefully I'll be entertaining. At the very least, I'll show some movies. Um, so I was asked, I mean, really a few years ago now to work with the veterinarians here at Columbia to come up with some, some water regulation guidelines. And um, that sounds like a sort of a horrible burden and a lot of work, but really it was it was quite educational because it forced me to think about, well, what do we really do? Why do we do it that way? What, you know, why do we think this is the right way to do it? How would we codify that? And I'm not even entirely sure whether what I'm going to describe is performance standards or engineering standards. I, I think it has the flexibility that you want from performance standards while still having the precision that you want from engineering standards. But I'll be curious to see how the rest of you would categorize it. I think the main theme of, of what I'm going to present is that animal training, um, by which I also mean keeping the animal performing well once they're trained, and fluid regulation are so intertwined that you have to consider them holistically when, when making all decisions. And so to sort of lead into that, I'm gonna start this almost the way I would start a scientific talk. And after about two minutes, we'll sort of, we'll, we're, we'll veer off. Um, so I study, I do not seem to have control over the slides. So slide. Or just yell at me and tell me what which button I should be pressing. I'm pressing a lot of buttons. Hey, okay. Mark, with your mouse. There you go. Yeah, you just click on the slide. All right, brilliant. Sorry, thank you for that. And thank you for setting this up for me. So um, I'm interested in understanding how motor cortex works. Motor cortex controls voluntary movements of your body. You could, of course, study neural control of movement in many animals, and one should. 
Uh, our favorite um, uh, animal is the rhesus monkey, and really for two reasons. The first is the similarity of the motor system amongst primates. Um, and the second is trainability. We can train rhesus monkeys to perform a very wide variety of tasks, which is really important and powerful in, in doing our science. And so I'm just gonna show you some of those tasks. This is a monkey whose name is, is Balboa, and he's performing a fairly standard reaching task where he's reaching to two targets uh, in order. Uh, this was him during his training. This is actually him now. He's been, been retired and is living in Texas. Um, this is what we refer to as our Pac-Man task. Um, the monkey presses on a handle, and the harder he presses, the higher Pac-Man rises up the screen. And his job is to make Pac-Man intercept as many dots as possible. And uh, there's no sound playing, which I hope there was, but it's fine that there's not. But in the background, you'll hear a lot of clicking. Um, sort of continuously, he's being continuously rewarded for for following this this dot path. Um, you know, sort of roughly maybe two three times a second, and the rate is higher the more accurate that he he tracks that dot path. Um, here's another example. This is uh, what we refer to as our cycling task. The monkey cycles through a virtual environment, and he stops on these glowing spots to receive a reward. Once the reward stops, he knows to cycle to the next spot. And something kind of entertaining about the video on the right is that uh, the pedal actually no longer does anything, uh, but he doesn't know that. Um, but in fact, we're all of the motion through the environment, we're decoding in real time from recordings that we're making from his motor cortex. So we're making our best guess as to what we think he's trying to do and then rendering that on the screen. And of course, if we could do a perfect job, he would never know that he wasn't controlling it himself and he would continue pedaling perfectly normally, which is roughly speaking what happens. Um, and... I am. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I'll skip over this pretty quickly, but we record neural activity. Um, one of the main things that we're, we're interested in, I'm sorry, these transitions aren't working very well, are these little discrete events called spikes. So each one of these is the, an action potential of a single neuron. That's what we analyze. They're the fodder for all the science we do and for, for example, the decoding that I was just showing you where in real time we can decipher uh, what direction he's moving the pedal in and how fast. And of course, the goal of this is, is to help human patients in, in hopefully the near future. So I think probably you can hear the sound now, I'm hoping. Um, but if you can't, imagine there's a lot of slurping going on. And as I said earlier, he's being almost continuously rewarded um, as long as he's doing the right thing in this task. And something that many people find surprising, but is very true, is that really our goal on every day is to maximize the amount of juice that he gets. The more juice he gets, the more data we get, or the more training time that we're able to give him. And so we maximize that in a number of ways. We always use a task he can perform well, so we start easy, we move him up slowly, um, we pick a flavor of juice, or sometimes they just prefer plain water that they find appetitive. Um, if he starts finding it difficult and gets frustrated, we immediately, within seconds usually, make it easier. Um, and then we steadily increase the reward volume during the day. So he may be getting eight times as much juice per second by the end of the day as at the beginning. So when he might normally be thinking, oh, I'm just about done, I'm ready to give up. He's like, oh, well, actually, you know, they're just getting really easy to get juice. I might as well work for a little bit more. Um, Something that might sound kind of strange, but monkeys are very respond very well to just random free rewards. It makes them feel that the, the world is optimistic and they should explore and do stuff and try things. Um, and then depending on the task in the monkey, we may, may pause, may give dry treats and things like that, and then, then go back to the task. And a session continues until the monkey is no longer interested in performing the task and, and won't perform it consistently anymore, even though you've increased the juice amount rather a lot. And again, our goal is always to get to this point, to have them consume as much as they want to consume until they're like, yeah, okay, I know you've given me a lot more juice, but I'm kind of done for the day. Longer session means more data, more training time, and of course it means more, more reward for them and therefore you know, better all around for everybody. So critically, um, you know, 
And this is based on, you know, no, no scientific study, but it is based on 20 years of experience and the experience of, of many, many colleagues. If done right, most monkeys, uh, monkeys that are healthy, monkeys that are emotionally healthy, will work for a daily fluid amount that meets or, or exceeds their metabolic needs. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, they'll gain weight if they're growing, if they're young, and they'll maintain weight once they're fully grown. Their urine and feces will be normal. Um, if you give them dry food, um, which we do a lot, they find the dry food appetitive. Um, and you find that they typically stop working at a similar amount every day. So if I'm a 300 cc a day monkey, every day I'll get somewhere around 300. Maybe one day I choose to go for 400, but usually I'm going to quit around 300. You can kind of tell that's about how much I want. And that typical amount may actually be more than I drank when I was on free water before the study started. So let me give you some hard numbers here. Um, these are not going to be exact numbers. They've been rounded slightly, but, but they're, they're pretty representative. So um, this is a free water test. We gave Jules all the water he wanted twice a day for half an hour. He could have as much as he wanted within those two half hour chunks. And here's how much he drank over five days during the week. Okay. And it averaged out to 300 cc's per day. Um, here's Magellan. Uh, we did the same thing. They were, they were cage mates, in fact. Uh, they were separated while they were drinking. Um, and here's how much he, he drank per day. And it's going to be um, a little bit less. He's also a little bit lighter. These numbers are quite monkey specific. They could be as low as 18 mils per kg. They, they could be as high as, as 50. And, and that's important that, that it, it is monkey dependent. So now let's consider Magellan now. So it's been a couple of years, so he now weighs quite a bit more. And this is the amount that he chose to work for, right? He worked until he chose to give up each day um, three weeks ago, except on Friday, he worked for about 280 cc's. And then we gave him some more because, hey, it's Friday. So uh, he's not working on Saturday. Why not give him some more? And you can see that he's actually consuming more in absolute terms, a little bit less in relative terms than he was before. He's also now, however, getting um, uh, some extra water um, in the form of produce and fruit. We didn't do that during the water test because we wanted it as accurate as possible. So all told, he's getting an amount that's fairly comparable to what he was working, uh, what he was choosing to drink on free water before. Uh, here's two weeks ago, Similar story. Um, this starts to belabor the point a little bit, but 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 bear with me. Um, and then this was just last week. He's, he's actually gained a tiny amount of weight over the last couple of weeks. This is how much he worked for last week. Um, and then of course there's the extra little bit of juice or of, of fluids that he get gets from from fruit and from produce. And that's actually kind of hard to estimate exactly how much it is. But again, you can tell that he's getting an amount that's not too dissimilar from, from what he, he received before. So I'm gonna focus now on, on these days when he was in full charge of um, uh, how much water he got and chose when to give up. And I took the average across three weeks and this is the number I got. Do you, yes. You have a two minute warning here. Great, thanks. Uh, he got 220, 28 milliliters uh, on average and um, with a fairly tight standard deviation. So imagine we came in on Monday and Tuesday and this is how much he worked for. We would know that there was, was likely a problem uh, and we would need to do something about that. So this number here, 228, is what we would call uh, his working water consumption. Um, and of course, it can vary a lot from monkey to monkey. So here is Knud. He's a very different monkey. He weighs slightly less, but he likes to drink a lot more water. Does he actually need all those fluids? I'm not sure, but that's what he wants. So that's always going to be what we allow him to earn. And then he gets this extra, again, fruit and so forth on top of that. So we have these two very different numbers, but in both cases, they're what the monkey chooses to work for himself, and they maintain a stable weight um, over the, 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 the adult lifetime of the animal. And you can tell now that we would interpret these water amounts on a Monday and a Tuesday very differently, right? So for Magellan, that would be totally normal. And for Knud, we would have some reason to con for concern. So this is our recipe. Know what the WWC is for each monkey. Allow the monkey to work for as, as much as they want. Keep track very carefully of how much that is and, and weigh them every day that they work. And then, then make other reasonable observations as well. Um, 
most of the time, everything is going to be normal, and that's how you want it to be, right? They will work every day for roughly the WWC. They'll very, be very close to it on average. Their weight will be stable, and all other signs will be normal. And if anything unusual happens, which is rare, but of course it can happen, you will know it. And of course, you know, like in the Chekhov quote, all happy families are happy in the same way. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. There's many ways in which something could deviate from normal, right? He could, in this example, not be getting enough fluid, and you would immediately be concerned, give him extra fluid and do something. Uh, in this case, he might not be working very well, but you notice his weight is increasing and his feces are very wet. You might, for example, suspect that he was uh, stealing or gaining fruit or fluid that was meant for another monkey and investigate that possibility. So to finish up, um, I'm just going to skip over that slide. Um, this is our recipe. Um, it's really, in all honesty, Everybody I know does this formally or informally. It's really the only way to do the kind of work that we do. You kind of have to let the animal tell you how much they want to work for on any given day. Um, but you're still keeping, you have a lot of flexibility, but you're still keeping track of some very specific numbers, weights, exactly how much they, they work for on each day. And you're using those often in consultation with your colleagues, with the vets to make informed decisions whenever anything isn't normal. Um, and I will just uh, finish with that and um, turn it over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you so much. Kate, you're next. Hey, host has still disabled person participant screen sharing. There we go. Perfect. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I am I am Kate Pritchett Corning. I am from excuse me Harvard University, and I'll be speaking with you today about engineering performance and practice standards. So I have a few slides to get through, so I'm going to kind of rock and roll here. Okay, uh, a few disclaimers. This is me and mine. Any mistakes are all mine. Anything that's good about it, you can credit Harvard for. We, we kind of need it right now. <laughs> so uh, in the eighth edition of the guide, we on page six, really early on, we see several um, words being used. And uh, we see engineering standards, performance standards. And I think that a couple of other speakers have brought to the fore that practice standards haven't really been discussed or debated as much as engineering or performance, the practice kind of gets lumped in with performance. So Dr. Garber went through all of these pretty exhaustively earlier in the day, so I don't want to belabor the point, but engineering standards tend to be prescriptive and provide limited flexibility, but they're easy to, you know, you know if you're in compliance with an engineering standard, it's yes or no, it's black or white, it's not maybe. Performance standards have describe a desired outcome, but you get flexibility in how you get there, and they require professional input, sound judgment, and a team approach to achieve some specific goals. So it's a lot less squishy regulatorily, if that's a word. Finally, we have practice standards, and those tend to come into play where we are venturing into parts unknown. We're venturing into hey, I'm a veterinarian and now honeybees are animals. I don't understand. Let's go back and gather more information on honeybees or cephalopods, or we don't have published scientific literature or a wide body of it. We don't have definitive sources. We have to look at what people are doing out in the field and we supplement our guide information with practice standards. So the guide very specifically says, in most situations, it's designed to provide flexibility so that we can modify our practices and procedures and keep up with changes. Is it really being used this way? And a lot of times, you know, I would argue no. But let's get in the way back machine because I'm a mouse person and that's kind of all I've ever done and all I'm really interested in. And we're gonna talk about mice and we're gonna talk about a small, side, we're gonna have to take a little side foray into rats real briefly because, you know, everyone tends to look at rats as large mice, even though they're not, whatever, anyway. Okay, so this guy is Walter Maxey. He is the founder of the Mouse Fanciers Club in the UK, started in 1895. Uh, in the early 1800s, mice sort of came to be pets, right? They found their way into Europe thanks to the opening of Japan. Japan got them from China. 
um, the ancient Romans and Greeks had them, but organized mousekeeping per se wasn't really a thing in Europe. Sailors brought mice back as pets. And of course, people were like, these little animals are cool. Let's keep them in our homes. Let's set up mouse shows. So Walter Maxey had standards for his UK mouse club. And we had mouse fancy or mouse cages. We had the breeding cage here, which was about 90 inches square. I'm not going to do it in science units because none of this stuff was in science units. Uh, or Davies, uh, uh, someone who was publishing at about the same time as Max, um, as Maxie, had 12 by 6 inches, and they were all about 4 inches tall. This over here to the far right is a show cage, so when you were exhibiting your mice on, um, on, on show, this is what you would put them in for the judges to evaluate. Why do we call these cages shoebox cages? Probably because a lot of these people actually just put their mice in old shoe boxes and cut a hole in the sides and nailed some perforated zinc over it and called it good. They describe shoe boxes, they describe chocolate boxes, they describe um, soap boxes, all these things as being used to house mice. So roughly contemporaneously, we have Lender King Caging being founded. We have the Hygienic Laboratory in the US in 1904, uh, specifying that animals are, you know, you're not allowed to inflict pain on animals if you're using them in research. The Hygienic Laboratory becomes the Public Health Service in 1912. The Jackson Laboratory is founded in 1929. Charles River in 1947, the Animal Care Panel. ILAR, now Bosker, is that what we're going for? I don't remember from earlier. We have the American Board of Laboratory Animal Medicine. We have Thorn Caging. And we have what I found is the first sort of published information, like a little book on a practical guide on the care of laboratory animals. And in 1958, there are no cage sizes given. There's still a debate raging on whether wood or metal is best. Glass is you know, uniformly seen as too heavy, also slippery, also cold. Um, and plastics are durable enough yet, but there's a lot of hope for the future. Plastics, my boy. Um, it's it, this this book encourages suspended feeders versus as more sanitary than food on the floor, and there's debating solid versus mesh flooring. In most cases, though, it's recognized that at this time it's almost a bespoke solution for an individual institution. You know, you have this size room, you're going to put this many cages in it. We'll build you the cages to fit however it needs to be. Elizabeth Kraft moves the field forward by developing microisolation caging. Then Edwin Less at Jacks prototypes individually ventilated cages, goes into development with Thorn for further development. Technoplast comes on the scene. And then in 1968, Cook develops a, the first true individually ventilated cage for, to protect users from microbiological contamination, not mice. So, but we start to see the motivation is to protect animals that are being housed in laboratories from infectious diseases that kill them and try, we're trying to keep them alive. We're also beginning the germ-free and really clean mouth era with this sort of, of stuff. So here we come to 1963, um, the first and second edition, as far as I could tell. So we have 14 inches squared here for a mouse cage. This is what a, a, a mouse, you know, a group of animals is one to six. The square feet, if you convert that, it's about 14 inches squared per mouse. They don't, they, you know, assume an average weight of 20 grams. And I have it on some fairly reasonable authority that the way this number was determined was at the meeting where a lot of this guide was worked out. People looked at the cage and said, I don't know, five mice seems about right. So, I mean, how things happen, right? Are there references in the first edition of the guide? Yes, the Animal Welfare Institute and their comfortable quarters for laboratory animals, which is still being published and regularly updated. That's the only reference that is uh, appears to be there for um, design and construction of animal quarters and cages. I don't even know if it addresses mice. We get into the third edition where we have 10 square inches, but I have also circled here our brief foray, foray into rats Notice that the height for an acceptable height for a rat cage is eight inches. Now we have the founding of ALAC in 1965. We have the passage of the Animal Welfare Act in 1966. Allentown founded in 1968. Lab Products in 1969. And the next edition of our guide doesn't specify group size, um, but this is 1972. And we're back to 12 inches squared for 20 gram animals. But rats have shrunk. They only get seven inch tall cages now, not eight. 
for no apparent reason. Rats did not get appreciably smaller over that time period. Anyway, uh, 78, 12 inches, Robert Sedlicek, moving the, again, moving everything forward, um, develops filter tops around 1977, and there were unanticipated consequences in filtering, um, in providing, you know, protection to the animals from the environment in that it allowed the buildup of ammonia and other gases. He wasn't planning for this because he had worked with germ-free mice, which didn't have urea producing bacteria, so didn't create you know, ammonia and didn't cause these problems. So now we have to figure out again how to remove gases from the environment and the IVC cages come back around, this time for animal welfare, not human welfare. Back to 12 inches squared in 1985, back to 12 inches squared in 1996, and then in 2011, we have our 12 inches squared plus our, now our caveats with female with litter and different sizes of mice, um, and, and other breeding configurations. So we have our, our caveats there in terms of just the number of mice per cage. But what, this is great, right? We have a history. Now we know how all these things came to be, but what do mice really want? And, and why are we so sure that they can get it from engineers and engineered solutions? Mice want to explore. They want to explore their vi environment. They're very driven to explore their environment. They're very driven to make a nest and they're very driven to you know, consume food and chew on things. How many of these things do we allow them to do in our particular caging situations? But what we should really be considering is why do we use mice at all? We use mice because of their incredible inherent genetic and behavioral plasticity. Who else shows about this much level of behavioral plasticity? Why humans? We can live in Tokyo and we can live in Montana. We can live in all these varying housing densities fairly successfully because we can adapt our behavior. Mice are domesticated animals. I, I mean, I don't even wanna to touch non-human primates because those are not domesticated animals. I, I mean, in terms of addressing their cage space needs, but in terms of mice and most other rodents, we have selected animals that will tolerate and perform adequately under a wide variety of conditions. If it didn't breed in Abigail Lathrop's shed or Jax's creosote coated cages, it doesn't exist now. So we have deliberately suggested, I mean, uh, selected for this. This is your two minute warning. Thank you. So um, uh, my colleague who will be speaking tomorrow, Brianna Gaskell and I did some work on this uh, when we were both employed by Charles River. And I encourage you to check it out. We basically bred animals at you know, half the density, double the density that the guide recommended, and we found no differences in performance and only very small differences in behavior, indicating that mice will tolerate a lot, so will rats. So engineering standards can be shortcuts, right? It's easy to look in a cage and count five noses. You're check, you're compliant, done. And some engineering standards, I don't want to argue with. I don't want to work in standing water. Thanks. That's a good engineering stand standard to have, to not have water on the floor. But performance and practice standards may differ from engineering standards, but we have a lot of institutional inertia and sunk costs that may preclude changes. Your robot is set up to only work with one type of cage. What Are you going to move out from that type of cage? Not when you have a labor shortage, not when you have other constraints on your time. Um, money doesn't grow on trees. Grants don't go, grow on trees. Scientists are in, interested in maximizing the performance scientifically of the animals they have. What that looks like varies from scientist to scientist. And depending on the institution or regulatory body, working to performance or practice standards may be an unfunded mandate. It's really hard to get money to study the welfare of mice. Really, really hard. And so there's a lot of unaddressed gaps in the literature that should be addressed because it's just hard to get money to fund it. And you can't always ride on other people's scientific coattails to just like, can I borrow five mice here? Can I look at your data here? It, that's a tough, that's a tough sell. So worshiping at the altar of efficiency and cleanliness though may not be what's best for animals. Um, you get locked into these engineering solutions, you get locked into these capital outlays. Um, you know, the latest engineering solution is elimination of humans in the process wherever possible. Who knows how that's gonna work? 
But what if we looked at mice and how housing mice and rats differently and using fewer of them with better experimental design and appropriate statistics? What if making some of these changes gave scientists richer, more reproducible, more repl replicable, and more translatable results? What if these some of these small changes could do that for the animals and the scientists? So what I'd like to encourage us all to do is not look at, at performance standards as a way to bring out every last drop of efficiency in a system, but more as a way to allow us to work differently with respect and, and respecting the telos of the animals we work with and respect both animal welfare and human safety. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Kate. And finally, uh, last but not least, we have Steve. Please take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Neamey. I'm the head lab animal vet at Boston University. And I took the liberty, as is my want, to, to go beyond the, the, the confines of the assigned session because I've come to the conclusion that the guide, as it's currently uh, composed and used is broken and updating uh, is going to be insufficient. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their endurance for the, the last session of the day, but I also want to recognize the endurance of the standing committee. Uh, if this was a, a humane element, you all would be subjected to prolonged restraint for your multiple years of service. And I think you, you deserve some relief. Uh, one of the reasons that, that I've come to these conclusions is based on my familiarity with the guide starting in 49 years ago uh, when Jim Fox hired me as a vet tech wannabe with the fourth edition in play. Uh, but I was formerly on ILAR Council. I'm a co-founder of the ILAR Roundtable with Lita Anestadu. Uh, that was 11 years ago, and I was an invited reviewer for the eighth edition of the guide. Can I advance these myself? Okay, uh, these are my usual caveats. The eye works faster than the ear, so I'm not gonna read uh, all of the text, uh, but I have asterisked one uh, outlier. Uh, there's one and only one element that I've shared. I have shared opinions with some colleagues who unlike Mike Herkamp's uh, posse have agreed to be named uh, with their these being their own opinions for this presentation. This is a session devoted to standards. So I'm gonna start with why guide standards won't work anymore. And whenever I identify a problem, I always feel obligated to uh, propose an alternative. Uh, and this is not a session on guide format, but the two are closely related. So I'll close my comments with that, with that final uh, development. Knowledge accrues, uh, that's a given. Uh, with artificial intelligence, will our knowledge double every 12 minutes, every 12 seconds, every 12 nanoseconds? We don't know. Uh, but the realms of lab animal science and medicine, thankfully, are no different. We don't live in a, in a static body of knowledge. And even between editions of lab animal medicine published by ACLAM, every month, we are subjected to new knowledge through peer reviewed articles and other media and other channels. So getting to standards, whether they are engineering, performance or practice, I now recognize that the problem with standards is that they are conforming. And by definition uh, are presumed to apply to more than one situation, more than one institution, more than one need. Uh, and when you use the word standards or invoke the concept of standards, now you are adding more uh, uh, sclerosis uh, to those applications than I think is necessary. Uh, this isn't the newest uh, thought in this element uh, Francis Bacon, who is described sometimes as the father of empiricism, uh, over 400 years ago, uh, wrote that uh, our, our initial uh, emotions and reactions 
will lead us into presuming anything that is related um, is very well related and it gets us off the hook and allows us to be intellectually lazy uh, versus exploring alternatives and exploring either customized or individualized circumstances and explanations. So uh, when we look at the guide and we look at standards, uh, on two pages of the guide, we have conflicting uh, directives for when you should change a dirty cage. Um, and I've, I've belabored this point in the past, but it's not as simple as choosing engineering or performance standards. Uh, we now know with the Technoplast DVC that we track a lot of fighting uh, in cages with male mice shortly after that cage is changed. So if you change that cage unnecessarily or prematurely, that's an adverse event for those animals that may also have impact uh, with research data. Uh, we've known for a long time, and thankfully we practice that dams with young litters should be left alone. But as people have raised the option of spot changing only and abandoning the calendar, behavioral scientists have understandably pushed back that no, they want all their mice exposed to the same change ske schedule uh, that are in their entire uh, experimental population so that there's not a variety of experiences under those circumstances. So beyond wrong standard, beyond deleterious standards, what if guide standards are wrong? So this is uh, a quote from the guide uh, that specifically says rooms with magnetic resonance scanners or in which cryogen gases are stored must be equipped with oxygen sensors. Uh, I won't divulge how we finally came out because I don't want to risk our assurance, but this came up in our IACUC semi-annual inspections where we didn't have oxygen sensors uh, next to an MR scanner. Uh, and so we deferred to our safety office and safety engineers who provided us a more recent directive from a more uh, informed uh, body of authority uh, that didn't mention oxygen sensors at all. And if you went down the road of the guide, there could have been a lot of money spent, uh, perhaps unnecessarily. So uh, community standards of any types uh, are, are a, a, an unfortunate imposition, uh, in my opinion, on a variety of local circumstances that may or may not be covered uh, by those standards. And we have this false premise that today's standards of any kind are equal to and sufficient for quality and equal to or sufficient for welfare. Uh, that uh, conception and that attitude comes with the problems that are listed on this fortress wall that we've erected uh, around standards. So let's talk about the alternative uh, that uh, I've discussed with uh, my colleagues listed at the bottom of this slide about guiding principles instead of standards. And those guiding principles would include all of these characteristics and benefits um, that have been laced throughout today's conversation and I anticipate tomorrow's. We have some examples on the human research side uh, these are principles. We have the Belmont Report, which led to the common rule uh, that is promulgated uh, by uh, HHS at the federal level. And we're also very familiar with principles of humane experimental technique and the three R's that have been around since 1959. Conveniently, we have U.S. government principles that have been in practice for many years uh, that have pretty much uh, universal coverage in principle of all of the elements that we've been discussing today and likely tomorrow, and that the standing committee has heard ad nauseum uh, for the last two years. And you all know where to find this, so I won't spend any more time on this. 
Let me now talk about format uh, in my concluding remarks. I thank Taylor Bennett for scanning me the cover and page one of the very first guide. And there's one particular uh, uh, sentence here that I found illuminating. And if you can't read the fine print, it says, if the guide is to serve usefully, it must be a living document subject to change with changing conditions and new information. And this phrase living document has uh, appeared more, uh, more often, uh, more recently uh, in deciding if and how the format of the guide either could or should evolve. So just to refresh your memories, this was uh, two surveys uh, that were done on revising the guide that were presented at an NABR webinar uh, last fall. And when uh, the survey asked what format should be used for the next edition of the guide, a tiny minority of those uh, favored a living document taking uh, the language from the first edition of the guide by our founding fathers and relegated that to even less than an afterthought. And so my question here is given how long it takes in increasing intervals in updating the guide, and we're not even started in updating the eighth edition, um, how living, if we insist on a static format with standards, is that guy going to be? Thank you for your time and attention. Great, thank you so much uh, to you and all of the speakers. Um, won't I get started here with a question? Um, oh, sorry, I went to the wrong section. Um, this question is to Paul. Um, so looking at the BMBL, since uh, that sixth edition was published in June of 2020, and understanding that your role has now changed since then, but um, have you heard from colleagues or other stakeholders in terms of how facilities and programs have implemented that new guide and also if there have been any shifts in um, some of the findings from facilities and how they um, address the items outlined in, in the newest edition? The simple answer is yes. Um, we didn't make significant changes in engineering standards as opposed to the changes between the fourth and the fifth edition. And so those people who have had experience found that the changes that were brought into the sixth edition were relatively minor and were capable of being um, implemented within 18 months or so of, of the publication of the, the sixth edition. So um, the, the big difference is, as I said, we, we went to declarative sentences that have should, shalls, and, and must. Um, for the most part, it probably took about a year for that to be propagated through the system, but we didn't get a significant pushback from the community that said that, that this was an outrageous change and they needed to go back. Um, thank you. Because I was also thinking about in um, animal care and use programs when the last revision went into place, I was thinking about ALAC site visits and the shift in some of the um, uh, findings. And so I was just curious then also um, how that might have impacted the, the programs um, that uh, would follow the BMBL. Yeah. Um, let me just check here if there were any others. Um, Jenny, would you like to pose any questions? Sorry, I caught her off guard. Thank you. Um, sure. I think um, we're very fortunate to have such a slate of impressive speakers today. I think you offer a lot of wisdom to us, and I'm sure you've put a lot of thought into 
um, the topics that you presented today. Uh, I was just curious, given your experience, um, what you thought would be the biggest mistake that could be made when writing the next iteration of the guide? And conversely, what is the biggest opportunity? Why don't we start backwards um, with Steve? How much time do we have? How many weeks do we have to go through this? Uh, actually, it's a very short answer. There, there should be no further print edition of the guide. It should go to the internet. It should be annotated via a panel of experts, just like we rely on a panel of experts to accredit institutions under ALAC International, uh, and should be available to the public as a as an infinitely bottomless and helpful uh, resource. Thank you, Kate. Oh, um, I'm going to have to okay. slightly disagree with my learned colleague uh, next to me in the little square there because there can be some issues with pre-loading stuff. I mean, version control at the very least, and you don't always have access to the internet and you. Eh, whatever I get, I get the the need to have it updated more regularly and more reliably, and all those other things. I'm not sure if we're ready for for that yet. I mean, at least you didn't say AI because then I would have had to jump through the screen at you. So, um, I think our biggest opportunity is really to uh, a, a opportunity and challenge is to is to broaden the tent, bring in the species. I mean, I'm I'm on the AVMA panel for depopulation and. Guess what? Honeybees are animals now, y'all. Who knew? They've been plants for a long time, but now they're animals and they're being addressed as, you know, as part of the AVMA. We're looking at these at these animals that aren't typically animals. And I think if we broaden the tent in terms of, again, not with prescriptive standards, but with the the acceptance that there are many ways to keep an animal successfully, we're going to have a lot more success. Thank you. Um, Mark, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, I'll give a very um, both focused and self-serving answer, which is, you know, when doing primate research, water regulation is is sort of such a both important and hot button issue. And and in some ways, it's a little strange, actually, because in my entire life, I have never seen an adverse event that resulted from, from water regulation. And in fact, far more often, because of, of the procedures I described, we'll notice if an animal is sick um, before there's any other signs that a vet would notice, because we'll notice that they're not as interested in working. Um, but at the same time, it's very important to do to do it well. And as I, I, I think I'm kind of echoing the feelings about engineering standards that a lot of other people have mentioned. You know, there is a risk of something overly prescriptive, right? There's a risk of saying, oh, we know how much monkey, water every monkey needs, and this will apply to every monkey. And, and there is no number that you can pick. Any number you pick, it'll be too low for some animals and too high for others. And some animals will end up being unhealthy and other animals will end up not being usable. And so, I really hope that that section ends up being written in a way that that is maybe prescriptive at a high level, but still gives you the flexibility that you need. And I do think that different protocols can be written in different ways that formalize more or less the things that you do when things aren't going going to plan. So that that would be my hope. Thank you so much, and uh, Paul. I'm going to second Kathleen, and I'm going to have to pile on Steve on that one as well, that the idea of having electronic only uh, that gets infinitely updated is a disaster in a regulatory, regulatory environment, that there will always be that disconnect. And what are you going to say if you're the regulated entity? It's just not practical. The other part of, of having it being more um I mean, being less prescriptive and more performance-based, we don't know what the next species of, of desire is. I mean, with the coronaviruses and other viruses being found in bats, the bat population has exploded in a number of research institutions, and yet, you know, the standards didn't keep up with it. So to be able to have a performance-based standard for who knows what the next model species is, is, is important. Great. Thank you so much. 
I think that's all we have right now for questions, but let me just check with Jenny. Sure, I'm happy to help uh, wrap us up for the day. Um, I'll put, turn on my video here. Um, so it's been um, absolutely an incredible day. I think I speak for the committee. We've been spending a lot of time envisioning what this could be today and what it would be like to have all of these incredible speakers help provide some guidance and insight from where we've come from, why we're here today, and where we hope to go. Um, and I think we're well on our way to achieving that. So it's been very exciting to, to see this. Um, and we're really glad that you've all come together to help, help us do this. Um, so just as a brief recap, uh, today we learned about uh, the board, Bosker, that is supporting this process of generating the next version of the guide. We heard about how the eighth edition was created, rolled out, and adopted um, by what was Eiler at the time, as well as um, by ALAC. We learned about the phases and approaches being used to develop the ninth edition of the guide, including the many listening sessions, as well as the Vicross survey that help inform areas that need evolution and focus. Um, next, we delved into the first of three of eight total sessions uh, for this workshop, again, identified through um, the work of the Standing Committee and the listening sessions, as well as the Vicross survey. Um, those three areas were challenges of using the guide for regulatory purposes, using the guide from a variety of perspectives, uh, a lot of different kinds of stakeholders, academia, industry, government, as well as the bodies that help us um, adopt best practices. And finally, performance and engineering standards and where that balance is um, and the value that each may have to our programs. Um, the, there were a lot of themes that I felt came through throughout the day. Um, continued need for flexibility and performance standards balanced with clear expectations and definitions. Um, it seems that there's some agreement that we have to have a new approach to our formatting to keep up with the unforeseeable uh, changes that happen in the scientific fields, as well as with our models and our understanding of how best to provide the care for the animals uh, in our charges. We also need to have um, evidence-based recommendations with a bent toward being animal or telos focused um, and maybe rethinking performance standards from that angle. So we hope you will join us tomorrow. Uh, we'll begin again, uh, continuing on with our sessions four through eight, and those will be key topics in housing and husbandry, global implications for the guide, emerging issues for the guide, the format of the guide, and managing programs of the future. Jeff, you have anything you want to add for the end of the day or anyone else? I'd just like to thank all the speakers uh, for the excellent job they've done.